introduce you to Catherine Fitzmaurice. Simply, you're in the presence of a person. Every once in a while, there's someone who comes along and absolutely revolutionizes a field of study because of insight and long practice and stick to itiveness and dedication and passion and insight and ultimately a kind of genius for the kind of work that's being done. And it's, uh, it's our uh, in enormous privilege to have uh, Catherine with us for the next five days. I first actually encountered Catherine's work at UC Irvine in 1987. Her work has been a staple of my process as an actor and an artist and a teacher since 1987, since I first encountered it. Um, it was, I had never done anything like it before, um, and obviously, I still practice it. Um, it's extraordinary, <coughs> actually, to be talking before you know my work or have done or have worked with me. Um, so I'm sort of being asked to do a performance of listening. I'm a listener, not a speaker, and I know that probably sounds strange, but really a large part of voice work is listening. Um, and what my job has always been in the theater is to listen and then to react to what I hear. <laughs> it scared me. Yeah. And it was painful and uh, it caused a great deal of shift, mental shift, physical shift. And it interested me so much that my curiosity led me through all of the obstacles, such as fear and pain and. Um, what on earth is this mess that come up? And um, it just was so enormously rewarding when I started to share it that uh, I just kept looking and kept sharing. And as Jack says, it evolves every time. Every time I teach it, something different happens. And it was only really when I started teaching that I discovered that people couldn't do what I could do. I came up with it was a long, long process. Very long. I experimented and played and pushed people around and <laughs> trod on them and bullied them and uh, got them to breathe and that seemed to make a huge amount of difference. So then I got passionate about breathing. And I met a very interesting guy who I later married uh, <laughs> who introduced me to the work of Wilhelm Reich. And uh, this guy that I met was a bookman, and he handed me this book under the table. He said, read this. Um, it was banned. It was banned in America, and it was banned in England. It wasn't supposed to be read, but I read it anyway. <laughs> and it completely changed my world. And I started experimenting with the work that he had done, which is basically the Trevor work that I do, and um, some hands-on stuff. And that so completely married with my thinking that I continued that when we came to America. Then I started to do yoga, and that informed what I did. Nobody was doing yoga so much then. Now it's commonplace. Everybody does yoga. It wasn't that commonplace, and it certainly wasn't commonplace in voice class. Um, but I started to mix and match these things, and then I did shiatsu, which is hands-on. And then I began to see energy. So I did some energy healing work and some meditation. And all of these things gave me great insight into what is happening when a person is breathing to survive and what is happening when a person is breathing to speak. And those breathing patterns are not the same at all. I didn't really come up with the concept. I came up with the work and the concepts evolved out of that. I think practice really most usefully comes before theory. So rather than practice to prove a theory, theory comes out of what you do. And you see it happen again and again and again, the pattern evolves, and there's your concept. That's your theory. So that's the way I think. Um, so now at this very late age, um, I'm thinking about writing a book. <laughs>